फिर लड़ते हैं सुख से तस्वीर This is my father and mother. My mother was 18. Wow. He was 26. And this is, come on, I'll show you. Oh, this is so nice. Anniversary. Come here, you are here, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, my and, gosh, Tommy's little. Yeah. <laughs> I told you they were very little, but so cute so always. Cute. They were just adorable. Oh, my. Oh, so my all God. the family. You're a married man. When are you going to have kids now? <laughs> Soon. So I hope so. You promise. I know. Where do you want to tape? In the living room? Yeah. Show? Yeah, that's okay. good. That's okay. right. Well, I am a place that it's called Velike Luchki. That means big prairies in English. You know, it was the breadbasket around my area. There were a lot of farmers and they were producing a lot of wheat and corn and all the vegetables, everything. So it was quite a prosperous place. Yes, absolutely. Friday night was a beautiful evening with lit candles and, uh, you know, with the white tablecloth and the little, no matter what happened during the week, for Shabbat we saved our uh, food, the best food and the best baked goods we had Friday and Saturday, even some leftover on Sunday. It was beautiful. It was really a day of rest. My first childhood memory, I was about three years old. And I remember my uh, aunt's wedding. And I sang at my aunt's wedding. And, and they were amazed how I could sing. I still can sing pretty good, but I had never any lessons, but still I like to sing. That I remember because they were always, as I was growing up, they were complimenting me. On Saturday, we used to get together actually in my house and we were singing and dancing because we didn't have uh, videos and all that. Well, you didn't have at the time either, but we didn't have uh, phonographs or anything. So we were singing ourselves and dancing. I had three brothers and two sisters. So we were six children. Well, three of us are alive. The two brothers were killed in the concentration camp because they were only eight and ten, and they didn't keep those people because they couldn't work. They went with my parents straight to the crematorium. Well, first the Hungarian came. They took over. In 1939, the Hungarians took over, and then it wasn't good because it was the Jewish question what to do with them. So they took away each time more from us, the property, they took away from my father, the, the thing that he cannot work anymore. And I went in a hurry and learned to sew. So in secret, I was making clothes for friends and for elite. I learned very fast. In fact, they caught me working once, and they took, they took me to court, and 
I was alone because my parents couldn't go come with me. I went to court and a reverend who had two children, I made clothes for them. He was a witness that I did make clothes, but I didn't charge. He got me off. It was the Seder, and the Nazis evaded. That was the last Seder. And they were sitting in the next room, and my father and my grandfather were doing the Seder. They were watching us. We shouldn't go away, you know, because they wanted to take us away right after Passover. Well, the Nazis uh, came one morning. That was not the Nazis, but the Hungarian police. They came and said, gather your clothes, gather the valuables, and we are going, we are taking you until the war is over. When the war is over, we are going to save your keys and everything you, ha you left and you'll get it back. That's what they told us. I put on about 15 dresses, one on top of the other in order to have. We took the candles for, for Shabbat, you know, that lit on Friday night, and we still observed. You know, we had some food that we brought along, and then, they gave us a little kitchen there. We were about, I would say, about 100 families laid out in a big area. And we stayed there, and it wasn't comfortable because we were one next <coughs> another. We had to make room, but we got along very good. We figured, we'll go home. The war is going to be home over sometimes. Well, that wasn't so. Six weeks later, there come a, a, a SS and says, we are taking you to work. They were loaded us on trains. And we were eager to go because we thought it's going to be better. Who cares? We'll work. So when they loaded us on the train, they gave us, a, there was no toilets, a bucket. You can imagine. You, and uh, the train was a freight train. We slept on the floor. There was even no room. We were almost one on top of the other, because there was about a hundred people standing room only, so you, you imagine. The dignity was taken away. We had to go in that bucket, in front of everybody. You know how you felt? I cannot, it's hard to say what you could feel when you have to go pull down your pants in front of everybody else. But nature calls, so you got to go. Food was very minimal. It was no. We were hungry, and we already wanted to get there. It took us four days and four nights. Can you imagine in that bucket was once in a while emptied, you know, when the baby stopped, and it was spilling while it was all over the floor. Stench. Some people were dying, old people were dying. There was no food, and we were already so tired. We all said, I wish we get there. We got to Auschwitz. We come to Auschwitz. And they separate one from the other, you know. The parents and the small kids went on one side. We didn't know where they were going. They were throwing us out up 
of the train. The old people were falling because they didn't give us stairs. Uh, the young people could jump off, you know, and they were hitting them and dying right in front of them. Well, we saw it's no good. So a guy comes over to me, and I was hanging on to my brothers, eight and ten. I didn't want them to get lost in the crowd. So a guy, a Jewish guy who was a capo, he helped, they made them help. The SS made them as a help. And he comes over and he, and he says, Give those children to your mother in German. And I spoke German, so I understood his German. And I didn't know why he says I should be. And I hang on to them so much, I didn't want them uh, to, to, to get killed or lost. And he comes at the end when they were separating the mothers and the children and, and the fathers and the... And the young people, so, you know, that go to work. So, when they were separating us, he came and yanked out the two children from my uh, uh, hands. I was holding them on. He said, give them to your mother. And he screamed at me that the essay should know what he's doing. He just screamed. And my mother grabbed them and ran after us for a little while, and then they pushed her back to the other side. I didn't know where they were going. All I did is look back. She never looked back. I looked back, and she was walking with the children, and we were walking on this side. We didn't know nothing. So. If I don't give, if I'm stubborn and I don't give the children to when he yanked them out, I would have not been here. I would have been in the crematorium with the children because they never separated a child from a mother or a father because they didn't want screaming and carrying on. They went together because they didn't keep children and elderly. You know, my mother was old, she was only 40. My father was 48. So, we come there, and a horrible thing happened. First of all, they told us to undress and put the clothes down. And we'll, on the way out, we'll pick them up, but we are going in the showers, to shower. Well, I was glad to shower, I was already, you know, and put your valuables, and put everything you'll find. It wasn't so. We went into the shower naked. We went in the other side. They gave us the striped shirts. Never a towel or anything over the wet body. We went out the other way. We never saw our clothes again. Nothing. Nothing. They shaved off all the hair from the head, the pubic hair, under, everything was shaved. So my first experience, we, we asked there, the SS, when are we going to see our parents? Guess what they told us? See this? When it's, where it's burning, that's where they are. Your parents and your, and your family are there. Well, I thought they're crazy. I mean, how, how could any human being do to another, you know, such thing? And the world stood by, and, and nobody else had a finger, not even God, okay? So, we started to scream and cry, and they started to beat us not to do that. And I started to yell out the names of, the, of my sisters because I didn't recognize them, you know, all shaved. I felt I have two sisters, I want to cling to them, and I still didn't believe what happened. 
so as I was screaming the names, an SS runs to me close and runs so fast and gives me a big slap in the face that I didn't see stars. I was blinded from her. That's how hard she hit me. So that was for the evening. They served us a soup and no spoons. And when we were drinking the soup, we counted that everybody should have, my sisters, we shouldn't take from each other like three times I swallowed and my sister until we finished it, which wasn't much. Believe me, one could have had enough from that saucepan. For breakfast, we had black coffee. That's it. And, and, and uh, for, for lunch, they gave us for three days this much bread. That's about three slices. Once a week. Because they were giving bread out and a little cheese once a week. This is what we did every morning, black coffee. The people were eating the grind from the coffee. And, and uh, lunchtime, a, a little bread with uh, whatever they gave us, cheese. And, f and at night, we were having soup and hungry all the time. I tell you, the hung I can't be hungry now, because if I'm hungry, it reminds me of the past. The first night came, and they put us into cages. They were one, two, or three. The cages were not more than nine, nine by twelve, not even that, nine by nine. About twelve girls together in the cages with a little blanket, and we were like sardines, put the next to one another, and that was our sleeping. And the, the hoping was, well, maybe the war will be over. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Didn't get better. It got worse every day, the same. And we were, that, this was still, they woke us at 5 o'clock in the morning to count us if nobody ran away. So we got up in the morning, and that was before they gave us the coffee. And I tell you, it was cold. It was miserable. We were huddling because there it was very, very cold in the morning in Poland. That was in Poland. Because I was one night, heard them scream in the crematorium. I heard the people scream. I didn't know how close it was to my barracks. They were screaming like somebody staring them apart. And all of a sudden, it in unison, they was, and then it quieted down. We stayed there in Auschwitz for about six weeks in the same rapid, you know. Then one day they take us out, about 500, 500, no, a thousand girls. And they put us in a big, big, huge room six weeks later. You know, there was no work for us. They didn't know what to do with us. So they put us in a huge room. And I remember still today that there was um, wooden floors. Some stood, we wait an hour, we wait two hours, we wait. We look at each other, what in the world are we waiting for? And, you know, we never knew what, what's going to be next day. The fear was tremendous. All of a sudden, after two or, two or three hours, I know it was very long, uh, an SS woman comes over and she takes us out. She says, come on, come on, out, 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 out. Then she says, you know where you were going to go? You were waiting for the crematorium, but it was too busy and they didn't get to you. But we got an order that you are going to the, to the crop factories to work, so you're saved. We went 
We were there. They gave us already beds. Soldiers were there before, you know, with uh, not mattresses. Hay was stuffed into. It was fine. You, we figured it's better than on the floor, you know. Or in Auschwitz and those pages. So, but the bombarding was impossible. They were bombarding and we didn't, they didn't, the SS ran to the bunkers, but we stayed put. They kill us, they kill us. That didn't make a difference. Can you believe in miracles that we, we weren't hit? I was making the springs for the guns and for the cannons, for all the munitions. And I had a foreman who wanted to run away with me, to hide me. I says, I can't go, I have two sisters. He says, you cannot take the sisters. I can hide you, but not. So I'm not going. And I didn't go. One day, the, the, the Allies were coming closer, they, so they took us away again. We shouldn't be liberated, you know. So they took us to Bergen-Belsen. Well, I thought it would be better on the train. We had no food, nobody gave us anything. We were miserable, but somehow some of us survived. Some passed out and died. and. And that's how we got to Bergen-Belsen. Now, Bergen-Belsen was total hell. The first day I got there, I saw a, a mountain of corpses thrown one on top of the other. And I looked the other way because I couldn't look. I couldn't look. We come there, and you see skeletons with diarrhea, typhoid fever with diarrhea, just running out the species on the floor, all over, even when there we were sleeping. I was sleeping at night there on the floor again, spread out a little blanket they gave us. And in the morning, I saw around me dead people, you know. And when I got up, I thought, oh, I'm still alive? How is that? And so it was. For six straight weeks, people were dying. I did. I was holding my own, and I was saying, "Oh, and I, my hair grew out, you know, and it was kind of nice. I had nice baby hair." And an SS came over to me, a woman, if I can do her hair. I said, "Sure." I did my best, and I did a nice job, actually. She gave me food for that. So it helped me over a little bit, you, you know. Then I told her I can knit mittens for her, you know. And I, I in the dark, because it was dark, by the outside light, by touch, I made her mittens and a scarf. I knew that she brought me the needles and the, yeah. So I was her, I wasn't her friend, but she treated me a little nicer. So that was my survival. I shared with my sisters, whatever, you know, I could. And, and that was for, for six weeks we were there. And I thought to myself, well, they are so close, the allies. I should survive and my sisters. That's all you were thinking is of yourself. Somebody else dies, they die. You are so used to corpses are lying all over, and then we didn't know it was the end. And all of a sudden, the British soldiers marched in, and we started to jump and scream, and holding on to them, we held their hands, we, we, we you know, we were 
touching them and not letting them go. And they kept on saying, we, are, we didn't understand English, but somehow we communicated. And they gave us chocolate, and they gave us, started to give us food. That was six weeks later, after all that torture, liberation, we were like skeletons. I mean, I weighed maybe 70 pounds. And we were hanging on and, and dancing, and, and they still were shooting. They still were shooting deaths. But finally, that stopped, and more soldiers came in. They were very kind. They couldn't believe what they saw. They just couldn't believe. Corpses all over. Sick people. People were still dying because they had nothing to, to live with. They don't had no food. Listen to this. So the soldiers, uh, so three days later, I got sick. I passed out. Well, but well, the soldiers were there. They had army hospitals. They took me to the hospital. How did, they, how did they do? They had to de-lice me, full of lice, filthy, sick. So they took me to a place where they put white powder, you know, for the, to take the lice. And then they showered, you know, naked again with men, soldiers. It didn't matter. I was so sick. I didn't care what they are doing with me, you know. Put me there, and my sister, the other sister was sick too. And my younger sister wasn't, so she wasn't going with the ambulance. The, 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 the younger sister who died, Helen, you remember her maybe, she was holding on to the ambulance wheel. She says, you're going to drag me if you don't take me along to see where my sisters are going, because I am alone in this world, and I, I want to see where they are. She already didn't believe. She thought they are taking us to the crematorium, you know. So, you know, she cried and held on. And cried. You know what? They put her on the ambulance. They took her along. She should see, and she walked home from the hospital to the barracks, and every day, she wasn't supposed to come because it was a contagious disease, she came every day to see us. So there we were, I think, for three months, because we were so very sick. Temperature was like 105 and 106, and diarrhea, and you know, there was nothing left of us. It was a miracle that we survived. But the British took very good care of us in the hospital. Very good care. So that was the end. And, by the, and they took us to Budapest after that, you know. From Budapest, you know, they put us on trains, open trains, closed, all kinds, wherever they could put us. We were used to everything. It didn't matter. Free was free, and we were happy. I was wanted to go to my hometown to see. Nobody came. We came home and my brother, the three girls, my mother, father, grandfather, and some of them, they all were killed. All were killed. It was nothing. So we came to our house. We had a big house there. And it was ransacked. The furniture was taken out. The clothes were whatever we left. And then whatever possessions they took. So it was nothing to say. The Russians were there at the time, occupied right after the war. And we were afraid of the Russian soldiers. So from there, we picked ourselves up and came to the Czech Republic, from Carpathia to the Czech Republic. When we came to the Czech Republic, it was paradise. Just think about it. 
How can any human being do that to others for nothing just because you are a Jew? Okay? So we came back and naturally I was happy to meet my brother and other friends. Not many, some went with their little uh, with, with, with their little brothers and sisters to the crematorium because they didn't let go. So they didn't want any screaming. But uh, so that was done, we are home. We, we, we had nothing to stay for, the Russians took over. So we went to the Czech Republic because we were used to, to the Czech. We had freedom with the Czechs, you know. So we went there and we settled in Zsatec. And I have to tell you this story. My mother, before we separated, she says, I want you to learn Uncle Henry's phone number. No, the, the address, not the phone number. Because whoever survives, I don't know who will survive, and what we are going to do, where we are going to be, each of you should know. 1215 South Halsted Street, I still remember. South Halsted Street, we are in the sausage company, and his name was Henry Davis. And she says, the only reason I'm giving you this address, not his home, because they will find him. Because we and the sausage will be there. If, he, if it's a home, he might, how intelligent she was, they, he might move around and they, you know. But sure enough, my, my uh, brother sent a telegram that we, the four of us survived, and my uncle sent us papers. And within a year, we came from Jatets to America. We flew to New York. There was no airport here in 46. And we came by, by train to America, and that's how we settled. First we were living with my uncle. Can you imagine my aunt had three children of her own, and she took in three girls until we got situated and got work. And then we somehow got our apartments and we moved away. But in the meantime, we were taken care of by relatives. So, like I say, it was horror that never leaves me. But in the meantime, I have a beautiful family that includes you guys. And I go on, sometimes I'm sad, but most of the time I'm happy that I survived. That's unbelievable. The story is unbelievable. Hitler didn't succeed. Because we're here.